<laughs> that is one big pile of shit. Now, this could be it. We may be in some multiverse where I don't even exist. Don't knock rationalization. Where would we be without it? Yes, yes. Yes, without the use. To take them, take them out, take them down. Do your, do your stuff. Life uh, finds a way. Hello and welcome to The Complete Works, a deep dive into the career and films of actor Jeff Goldblum. My name is Mike Smith. Joining me on this journey into the wondrous world of Goldblum is my friend, co-host, and fellow Goldblum maniac, <laughs> Mike Tegucio. How are you doing today, Mike? I am uh, very excited. I'm doing very well. I was uh, very interested to hear your new uh, intro there. And right. there's like, it's a whole different number of syllables and it threw me all off. <laughs> yeah, I a actually, new cadence. yeah, I actually did this, this new intro that we're going to be using for the next four years. Uh, I wrote it in like the last five minutes before you signed on to this, <laughs> to this <laughs> because I realized in a last minute panic <laughs> that I hadn't written a new <laughs> intro or outro. Uh, so I actually don't even remember what I wrote for the outro. We'll find out at the end of the podcast. Um, but it's, it's Beautiful. down there. It's, it's down at the bottom of my document right now. So it'll happen. We'll find out. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in case you're joining us for the first time and you have no idea what we're talking about, uh, Mike and I used to do a podcast about Nicolas Cage, uh, where we used to say Cageaholic and things like that, uh, you know, kind of a Cage-centric intro. Uh, that podcast ended this past December, and now, after a brief hiatus, we're back at it again with another beloved actor, and one that I think actually shares a distinction with Cage, uh, of somebody who has gone back and forth between character actor roles and leading man status, uh, over the course of his lifetime, uh, and that is actor Jeff Goldblum. And uh, Mike, this was a very contentious thing. We were going back and forth on which actor was going to be season two of the Complete Works. Uh, so I'll just say that I won. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> and you can go hear that conversation if you want to on the uh, previous episode that we put out on this feed, uh, which was called, I believe, uh, Who Are We Podcasting About? Yes. So this very easily could have been the Eddie Murphy podcast. Mike, you were going for Eddie Murphy. I was going for Jeff Goldblum. And then we switched for a little bit. <laughs> uh, then we like switched roles and like, I kind of wanted Eddie Murphy and you kind of wanted Goldblum. And so we had our producer, Colin, uh, do a tiebreaker for us and he went with Goldblum. And so uh, I technically won that one because he was my pick. So yay, Colin. I mean, I mean well, time will tell who really won, you know? <laughs> I guess that's true. I mean, I think an Eddie Murphy podcast would get done in about half the time it's going to take us to do this Jeff Goldblum podcast. So <laughs> maybe we did actually. So everybody... Lose. Everybody leaves us. Great. <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, when we were doing Nicolas Cage, uh, his career, I believe, started in a very different place than Jeff Goldblum's did. I mean, Nicolas Cage was pretty firmly entrenched in a film family. You know, he was related to Francis Ford Coppola, and, you know, he quickly changed his name uh, to try to make it on his own. Um, but it's clear that being from that family certainly gave him an advantage uh, in his early career. Uh, Jeff Goldblum, meanwhile the Jewish son of a radio broadcaster and a medical doctor in West Homestead, Pennsylvania. Uh, he developed an interest in the arts pretty early on, um, particularly focused on one, acting, and two, jazz music. Uh, he's always said that uh, wow. if, he, if he didn't go into acting, he would have been a jazz musician instead. That's probably uh, <laughs> how his life would have gone, which would have been a, a different choice. Which, I mean, recently, in recent years, he's made a couple of jazz albums, uh, so there is that aspect to him as well. So maybe we'll review those one day, Mike, hopefully. Uh, I, when, I, when we, I'd be down. When we, when we were talking about uh, other people to do, I had suggested Steve Martin, and I was like, we can review his banjo albums. Uh, and, yeah. And I believe that's when you shot that idea down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to insist on Jeff Goldblum's jazz albums. That's that's not going to be for a very long time from now. So a little bit more precursor backstory. Jeff Goldblum moved to New York City when he was 17 to try to become an actor, and spent a couple of years training under uh, renowned acting coach Sandy Meisner, who also worked with people like Alec Baldwin, uh, Jeff Bridges, Sandra Bullock, and Tom Cruise, to name just a few. There's dozens of names wow. on that guy's Wikipedia page, uh, which is where I do all of my research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, Jeff Goldblum uh, began working on the stage. He actually made his Broadway debut in 1971 as part of the chorus of Two Gentlemen of Verona, which won the Tony Award that year for Best Musical. Uh, so which is kind of like his first major acting credits. But we're not talking about his stage credits, Mike, because it would be very difficult to do so because we were not alive in 1971 to see him <laughs> in the play. <laughs> that would make it very hard. It would. It really would. Uh, so the goal of this podcast is to discuss each and every film in Jeff Goldblum's career, one at a time, in great detail, and often way more detail than is probably actually required. 
<laughs> and, and for Jeff Goldblum's film career, it all began all the way back in 1974, three years after A Two Gentlemen of Verona, with Michael Winner's Death Wish. Enjoy a typical afternoon in New York City. Who is it? Groceries, man. My name is Paul Kersey. How's my life? I'm sorry. She died a few minutes ago, Mr. Kersey. Any chance of catching these men? There's a chance, sure. Just a chance. I'd be less than honest if I gave you more hope, Mr. Kersey. This is Paul Kersey. This is the story of a man who decided to clean up the most violent town in the world. I said, turn around. Give me the money. He begins where all the super cops leave off. Logging has gone down by how much, sir? 950 a week to 470, if you reported last week. You understand not too many people know that. And uh, you want to keep it that way, huh? Oh, no, we have to keep it that way, Inspector. This whole city would explode. And if this person is listening to my voice, I urge him in the name of law and order to desist from this one-man crusade and turn himself in to the police. Let's see the money, man. Call him a mad vigilante. Call him a hero. Either way, he's always on target. We want you to get out of New York permanently. Never make a death wish, because a death wish always comes true. And you get to love it. So 1974's Death Wish launched a five-film franchise for actor Charles Bronson and was recently remade into a Bruce Willis vehicle uh, directed by Eli Roth in 2018. Uh, although in development, this movie could have gone in many different directions. Uh, at one point, Sidney Lumet was attached to direct the movie. Sidney Lumet, who made Network, uh, 12 Angry Men, uh, Dog Day Afternoon, a lot of great films. Uh, he was attached to direct, uh, would have starred Jack Lemmon in the lead role, uh, which is bizarre to think wow. about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Henry Fonda would have played the uh, police officer pursuing him also, actually. Um, <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, very different movie, right? <laughs> uh, that would have been cinema with a capital C. Indeed. Uh, yeah, it definitely, it definitely feels like, you know, this was definitely a much more grimier exploitation type movie. And the movie mm -hmm. with that cast and that director would not have been that, I don't think. It would have been like a much more like prestige picture kind of thing. Um, yeah. But Sidney Lumet left to go make Serpico with Al Pacino instead. Uh, and eventually, Michael Winner was chosen thanks to his track record of gritty action films like The Mechanic and The Stone Killer, both starring Charles Bronson. Uh, and he's the one who brought Charles Bronson on board for this movie. Uh, and Charles Bronson actually thought he was pretty miscast for the role, uh, as originally written. Um, because or really? <laughs> originally, the role, um, which was adapted from a novel originally, uh, had Paul Kersey as like a, a meek accountant uh, in his in his early life before he becomes a vigilante. And Charles Bronson saw that description and he was like, yeah, that's not me. Uh, <laughs> he actually suggested that um, Dustin Hoffman should have had this part. Um, wow. Which, whoa, that would have been a different movie. Uh, and actually, I think a really interesting movie if Dustin Hoffman ends up taking that role. Um, Is this before or after Straw Dog? This would have been, Straw Dogs was 73, so this would have been filming around the time Straw Dogs came out, actually. Um, wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Uh, but yeah, Death Wish ends up getting mixed reviews when it came out, uh, with some taking issue with the way the film appears to support vigilanteism and the work that Bronson is doing, which was a major complaint about the recent remake, too. Others were pretty taken by the movie's depiction of New York City and found many sequences to be exploitative, but realistic to how New York was really like in the 70s. Uh, so where does Jeff Goldblum fit into all this, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> That's the real question. That's what this podcast is all about, right? That's why we're here. Exactly. Uh, well, Jeff Goldblum actually is a key part of the inciting incident of the film. Uh, this is his screen debut, and he's only in about three minutes of the movie. Uh, his impact, though, is felt throughout the whole thing. I mean, Goldblum plays freak number one, 
Uh, that's his character's name. <laughs> uh, and really would go on to play that character for the rest of his career. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, he plays freak number one, uh, one of the punks who breaks into Kersey's house, uh, kills his wife, and rapes his daughter, uh, thus inadvertently inspiring uh, Paul Kersey to begin his crusade. Uh, so literally the entire movie happens because of Jeff Goldblum's character, even though he never reappears after his big scene. Um, although apparently a very early draft of the script did have Paul Kersey confronting those three guys again at the end of the movie, uh, and then Paul Kersey actually dies as a result of tangling with them in the finale um well see yeah i'm not sure if he killed them first and they killed him like in retaliation like, like obviously, obviously not killing him in retaliation but like they killed each other kind of thing <laughs> yeah 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 he killed me so i'm gonna kill him uh, i don't know <laughs> but yeah and we should note obviously this movie has um a lot of discussion about rape and there's a very brutal rape scene towards the beginning of the movie uh so if that's a triggering thing for anybody obviously feel free to skip this episode or whatever in the grand scheme of jeff goldblum's career like this is a pretty skippable role, I guess. Like it's it's very right. it's very different than the image of Jeff Goldblum that we know later on in his career, right? I feel like absolutely, yeah. I mean, what his character is uh, in this movie is not like anything else. I mean, he he plays the weird freaky guy in a lot of movies, uh, right? But the just the the like uh, outright like uh, vileness, the the creepy sleaze. Uh, a freak number one is pretty unique to Death Wish, I think. <laughs> yeah, which he which he dives into with the plum in the movie. I mean, he really stands out among the freaks, I think. Uh, and that might just yeah. be because it's Jeff Goldblum, and I don't know who the other two guys are. But <laughs> <laughs> but it, he does like stand out. He's kind of the leader of their gang, and it just feels like you know he like it's his first screen role, and you can tell like he's kind of relishing the opportunity to have that in his filmography. You know, like, to be able to get into movies, uh, even if it is like this really despicable character. Um, but so Goldblum plays a small but key role in Death Wish. Uh, so who else we got in this movie? Uh, you got the legendary Charles Bronson as Paul Kersey. You got his wife, Joanna Kersey, played by Hope Lang, known for Peyton Place and Laura Dern's mom in Blue Velvet. Um, Ker- uh, you gave like a head nod like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what it is, yeah. Uh, now Paul Kersey is being hunted down by Lieutenant Frank Ocha for about the second half of the movie, and he's played by Vincent Gardinia, who played Mr. Mushnick in Little Shop of Horrors, uh, which is <laughs> one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, and I was very excited to see him in this movie. Uh, from there, William Redfield from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest plays Kersey's co-worker Sam. Uh, Stuart Margolin of The Rockford Files plays Ames Jane Schill, uh, the guy who shows Kersey around Tucson. Uh, Christopher Guest shows up in this movie very uh, yeah <laughs> like that's a weird one uh, he he plays Jackson Riley the cop who finds Kersey's gun and hands it to Vincent Gardini at the end of the movie uh, Olympia Dukakis is in this movie uh, as P.O. Janetti uh, who's seen as one of the uh, one of the uh, police briefings she's like reading off a list or whatever Paul Dooley from Breaking Away and 16 Candles uh, is a cop in the hospital Eric Lenouville from St. Elsewhere is one of the mothers in the subway uh, Sonia Manzana aka Maria from Sesame Street is the grocery <laughs> store clerk <laughs> that's uh, dealing with Goldblum and his goons at the beginning of the movie <laughs> What is going on with this movie? Why is, are there so is, many people? It is jam-packed, Mike. Uh, political activist Tom Hayden, who was married to Jane Fonda for like 14 years, uh, is the ER doctor. And finally, uh, Al Lewis, a.k.a. Grandpa Munster, um, is the <laughs> is the uh, security guard in the lobby of Paul Kersey's building. So yeah, pretty wild cast <laughs> that, Holy uh, shit. that they had built for themselves uh, with this movie, filled with uh, veteran character actors and a few names that would become much bigger later on uh, in, as the decades would go on. Uh, and the movie was written by Wendell Mays, uh, who had also written films like Anatomy of a Murder, uh, which I just saw uh, recently for the first time, uh, Otto Preminger movie from 1959 starring Jimmy Stewart. Amazing movie. Saw that at the Roxy Theater, which is the Indian Theater near my house in Missoula, Montana. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he also wrote uh, The Poseidon Adventure, um, which, had just, which had just come out, uh, I think, the year... or That was 1972, so two years before Death Wish. And it was directed by Michael Winner, uh, one year after directing both Scorpio and The Stone Killer in 1973, and two years before his next film, uh, 1976's comedy One Ton Ton, The Dog Who Saved Hollywood. <laughs> uh, which I know, I know very little about that movie. I feel like I need to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's now a, at the top of my to watch list it is a dog who saves hollywood how have i not seen this movie five times uh, <laughs> uh and, he would, and he would also go on to direct uh, some of the death wish sequels death wish 2 and death wish 3 uh now the movie was released on july 24th 1974 it spent about 127 weeks in theaters so like 2.5 years 
<laughs> Jesus. Because that's how movies worked in the 70s. That's just what happened. Yeah, like, can you imagine a movie playing now for two and a half years in theaters? Like if Star Wars... We're lucky like if, if they get two months. Right, exactly. But, like, you know, like a big movie hit, like a Star Wars movie or an Avengers movie, will probably play for like two to three months, right? Like at, right. at most three months. Uh, like imagine if like Rise of Skywalker was just in theaters for two and a half years. Jesus Christ. How upsetting that would be. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it pulled in about uh, $22 million against a budget of about $3.7 million. So pretty huge success. Uh, for 1974 and obviously it launched a pretty major franchise for uh, Charles Bronson uh, yeah. so the IMDB plot synopsis for Death Wish reads a New York City architect becomes a one man vigilante squad after his wife is murdered by street punks in which he randomly goes out and kills would be muggers on the mean streets after dark uh, so Mike uh, before we get into our overall thoughts on the movie we should note that we've both seen Death Wish before um, I, yes. I saw this movie my sophomore year of college and so it's been a long time since I've seen it. Like, it's been about uh, eight years, I guess, which is weird to think that sophomore year of college was eight years ago, but still. <laughs> it's um, fucked up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's messed up. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit, Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think I, watched, I think I watched it because I had heard about it enough at the time. Like, it was one of those things that like, I had, like, heard enough about, and I was, like, get, kind of starting to get into kind of the grimy exploitation movie kind of stuff uh, from the 70s and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, and all the Death Wish movies were on Netflix at that point in time. So I was able to watch the first one, and I never actually watched any of the sequels. I still have not seen any of the sequels. I have heard that Death Wish 3 is really good, uh, or at least really interesting, or at least really insane. Uh, so <laughs> so there is that. Um, but yeah, but watching it again, I really, like, I remembered a couple of the different elements from the, that first movie that I'd seen eight years prior, but... Uh, you know, it, it felt like a fresh watch for me. Like I felt like I hadn't like I hadn't seen it in such a long time that it almost felt new. Um, and for you, you had seen it what like a year or two ago at um, one of the Hudson horror, horror marathons. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was last year. It was. Or I don't really exactly remember, but yeah. it was one of the last ones they had, or that we went to at least. I think Colin, Colin and I were there, and uh, it was one of the ones where it's all secret, uh, secret marathon. Right. So there was that really cool moment where like the movie opens. Uh, with that kind of like weird montage of, of Bronson and his wife, uh, you know, Curzon right. and his wife on vacation. And people, I like, people knew, like, as soon as Charles Bronson came up, everyone, like, kind of applauded. Yeah. Uh, but then, like, when that title card, Death Wish, hits, everyone just was like, yeah, like, the theater went nuts, <laughs> uh, which was fucking awesome. Uh, so that was a really cool experience. And, uh, and I've talked a lot about it on uh, Mike and Mike Go to the Movies and stuff, getting to see these kind of sleazy, uh, grimy 70s exploitation movies in th- a situation like that uh, kind of elevates all of them. Sure. Uh, where you're in a, th- a packed theater with people there to like enjoy that kind of stuff. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Death Wish is great in a situation like that. It was still fun uh, like at home on Amazon by myself, but I definitely w- missed that kind of feeling of like the applause and stuff like that when, right. when certain moments happen. Yeah, I get that. Now, you were telling me this, I think, last week, that you saw Death Wish in that theater, uh, and that when the Jeff Goldblum scene came on, the movie cut out or something like that? Or <laughs> Yes, did yeah. It, so you did you miss all the Jeff Goldblum stuff in the movie when you saw it that first time? Um, Almost. Well, no, it cut out... Um when they like kick the door in uh okay. so like the the freak the freak squad or whatever they're called uh you know we see the whole th- the whole situation when they're in the grocery store and they see the address and the delivery slip and they go to the apartment and uh the mrs kersey opens the door and they like bust in and then the film melted uh so <laughs> uh so i mean we kind of knew what was happening what was gonna go on right. you know kind of thing it kind of adds like it added like this weird more much more tension to the movie um, where, where like right at the attack uh the film cuts out and then uh i think it came back when his son-in-law calls him in his office so like the whole wow. ordeal yeah is where they got the film back on the projector and everything like that so i was r- shocked uh when i saw it this time and actually saw the attack and what's going on in the apartment uh when the freaks bust in because i didn't know what happened <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a very I mean it's a very brutal sequence too. Um, so in a way, yeah. in a way, I'm kind of like I kind of think you may have had the ideal viewing experience in a packed theater at least, where it's like you know, right. like th- those kind of, those kind of screenings and viewings are meant to be like pretty fun, and that's not like a fun sequence to watch. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so like having it cut out right before the attack starts and pick it up right where right where like it's over. 
that's pretty that's pretty cool that's that's actually like it <laughs> may, may have been the ideal viewing experience to watch it in that environment at least, at least. yes yeah it's pretty great like we all know what's happening uh, we don't necessarily need to see it uh, but i you know it was it was really interesting watching um the attack in this time uh it's extremely brutal and it's graphic and it's like uncomfortable but for some of these movies we've seen like of this era it's not really that great like i don't know how to say it's bad but it's not that bad um, yeah i, 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 I actually you know what really, i mean i know exactly what you're saying and i'm going to talk about that a little bit more i think later in the movie uh or later in this discussion um okay but i, I think you know the way it treats like this is a rape revenge film um which was a right. pretty popular subgenre in the 70s but a lot of a lot of those movies you know s- sensationalize the rape in such a way uh, that makes it like almost feel as if they're trying to make it titillating or whatever, or, like sec- like you know making it making it appealing sexually. And obviously, that's not exactly what you want to do when you're right. <laughs> when you're portraying rape on screen. Uh, and then it becomes like just the man trying to get revenge on the people who um, assaulted uh, the woman in his life or whatever. And this movie yeah. is that. Um, but I think there is you know at least some care. And I'm not saying it's perfect at this, but I think there is some attention paid towards the traumatic effect it has on the rape victim in the movie um yeah and the way the uh the actual assault is depicted i think is actually like it's very it's very straightforward and it's brutal and it's uncomfortable to watch but you know it's diff like it's not it it doesn't feel like titillating in the way that like some of those other rape scenes are filmed in other 70s movies yeah i'm thinking of uh savage streets which we also saw at a horror uh hudson horror show yes which went on forever and was clearly designed to be like exciting and like erotic and stuff and was like what the fuck is going on <laughs> right yeah no that's, that's a good point of comparison i think actually too yeah savage streets uh, if you haven't seen it actually a pretty good movie i think but like that whole sequence is like really rough <laughs> and, yeah but then you get to see linda blair uh attacking people with a crossbow crossbow so like it, you know there was you know yeah i mean there's that it's a trade-off but anyway so <laughs> death wish 1974 the very first movie we're talking about on this podcast mike what are your overall thoughts on the movie talk about a problematic fave uh yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> uh, this movie is rough uh especially that first act where you have to sit through the attack uh yep. you know the assault and everything uh, and then all the kind of uh, bleeding heart liberal jokes and and like the, if you if you can get over that stuff, which um, you know we just reviewed the gentleman on Mike and Mike go to the movies, which I didn't want to give it a pass for, yeah. because it's made in 2020. Uh, Death Wish is made in 1974, and it's made to be an exploitation sleaze fest. Uh, it gets like a little bit more of a pass for me. Uh, that doesn't mean it's okay. Uh, if the, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, but I'm I'm more willing to forgive that stuff or overlook it. Or acknowledge it and still enjoy everything else that's going on. Because uh, this movie is, like, a blast, dude. It's got that, like, we talked about, uh, there's another jazz connection. Uh, Herbie Hancock did the score. Oh, yes. So there's just, like, funk funk jazz stuff happening. Yeah. Uh, while Charles Bronson is just, like, stalking through the streets. So that that's, that's fucking cool, man. Like, Charles Bronson, <laughs> like, under a jazz, uh, a Herbie Hancock score. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Totally awesome. Yeah, I uh, I also like this movie quite a bit. Uh, I think it's a very solid action movie. I love, you know, I really love just like grimy 1970s New York City crime movies. Like that's like a sub yeah. a sub genre that I really love. And so this movie I think is one of the best examples of that. Like it de- it depicts New York really well. It's you know it's exploitative, but it's largely more interesting than a lot of the other similar movies being made around the same time. And I I, and I like the way you call it like a problematic fave, which I think you also said on Michael Michael of the movies when we reviewed the gentleman actually when 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 we said we were doing. <laughs> Death Wish, I think that's what you called it. Uh, I agree with yeah. that. Um, and I think it's also proof, like this movie, like I would point to as something that you don't need to necessarily agree with the movie's politics in order to enjoy the movie. You know, like the, like, the movie is yeah. like fire in all cylinders in every single, in every like which way direction. Uh, you know, there's problematic stuff. There's stuff that, uh, yeah, I, I don't agree with or endorse what this movie is doing, but like I'm really enjoying watching <laughs> watching the movie. Yeah. Uh, like Charles Bronson, uh, great in this movie. He's great in the lead role. Uh, and it's about halfway through the movie before he starts killing people. Uh, like that first half is all build up, done reasonably well, I think. Um, it manages like you know all the bleeding heart liberal jokes, like you said. Like I mean, I, th- I thought it was really funny. Like the first thing somebody says about him is like, "Well, Kersey, you're some bleeding heart liberal, aren't you?" <laughs> Yeah, um, because he cares about the poor, like right. literally, is what he says. And exactly. he's like, "Wow, you bleeding heart liberal." <laughs> um, okay, great. But it, it manages to make people believe that this guy, who everyone calls a bleeding heart liberal, and who was a conscientious objector during the Korean War, 
would go over the edge. Um, from what I from what I understand, the novel um, essentially condemns Kersey's actions. Like it was written, um, the author of the novel. Um, had the idea for it um, after somebody like stole his car or something or like you know right like just committed some kind of crime to him and he had like the thought like he was so enraged he had the thought of going out and trying to find the guys and uh, attack him and then you know he he calmed down and cooled off um, but then the idea for the novel kind of came by well what if somebody got in that headspace but didn't calm down from it um, and like mm-hmm. what would the consequences of that be uh, and this movie I don't think condemns Kersey's actions in the same way uh i think there's like lip service paid towards that a little bit but it really does <laughs> yeah it really does feel like it's kind of in, like especially by the time you get to the ending with like the final shot of the movie it feels like all right this feels like it's kind of endorsing everything that, <laughs> that paul kersey's been yeah. doing the entire yeah. time <laughs> there's a little while there where it's kind of like oh his life is starting to spiral out of control and right. like, you can't like you know there's like a little bit of that going on but i totally agree by the end like the cop's like, you are all right, bud. Get out of yeah. town. And then and like, he's the cool guy. Yeah, and like mugging is down in New York because of him. Like crime, yeah. crime's down like 80% or something. And like then he, move, then he moves to Chicago and it's implying he's just, just going to keep doing his stuff there. Like, like by the yeah. end of the movie. Uh, Good thing that middle class white guy got a gun. Saved New York City. <laughs> Which was, you know, I, I think it was interesting when um, I never saw the remake of Death Wish uh, with Bruce Willis. But that was a common criticism that I saw of the movie was that it's, you know, this middle-class white guy with a gun just taking matters into his own hands and shooting color people all over the place uh and that is what death wish is though <laughs> like like yeah. it, should, it should have been updated for 2018 or whatever uh, although actually and again to this movie's credit it's not just color people that he's shooting either it's like a, a mix of people that are you know being fl- like it's a, there's a lot of like different races and white people there's a lot of white people in the mix is what i'm saying <laughs> is what i'm saying yeah there is a couple of black people involved uh, as well but it's just an overall criminal element or whatever that the movie has, I guess. That's just, it's just, you know, criminals in New York City in the 70s. Uh, some yeah. of them are black, some of them are white. You know, it's, you know, it, he's a equal opportunity vigilante, I guess. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, but there's that, that one scene, though, at the, like, dinner party soiree with all the architect people uh, where the, the one guy who's, like, I guess also supposed to be, like, a bleeding heart liberal wimp dude, he's like, well, I think this guy's a racist. He's mostly killing uh, black people. And the one woman's like, well, that's because all the muggers are black. So it's like, oh, my God, what the fuck is this movie? I actually do not uh, remember But, yeah, that anyway, line, I don't know. So that's, that's, yeah, like, I, I, I actually do not remember that line. I do not remember hearing that. Uh, and if, that yeah, if that's the it's case, not great. If that's the case, then I retract everything I just said over the last <laughs> 90 seconds. <laughs> but, yeah, but the movie like has it like, where it's like muggings down and everything like that. It feels like an endorsement of the vigilanteism that he has, but... You know, again, problematic fave. Like it's it's one of those things. Yeah. Where it's like it's a real. It's also a really fun action movie. Just the way Bron- like it's Charles Bronson. He's being a badass, and he's you know he's got the gun and he's shooting people, and it's you know it's it's Death Wish. It's it's so weird to me as like a pop culture fact that Charles Bronson <laughs> is like the hot action hero of the early seventies. Right. He's like. He's this middle-aged, like, kind of flabby dude. Like, the movie starts with him in a Speedo with his, like, hot banging wife. And it's like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's it's a weird cultural thing where Charles Bronson was, you know... I, I, I don't know if he was the hot action star of the day, I guess. But, like, you know, I, I would say the movies that he was making were the kind of movies that, like, Jason Statham was making in, like, the mid-2000s. Where it was just... <laughs> Okay. They, they, yeah. they weren't like you know massive blockbuster hits because really blockbusters weren't a thing as much then. Um, yeah. But they were you know solidly performing stuff that people would just go see. You know. And Jason Statham literally remade the the mechanic. Yes, he did. So yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's an element of that also. Um, but all right. So that's our kind of our overall thoughts on Death Wish. Uh, we got to talk about uh, the man of the hour, Mike, the guy who is, has yes. inspired this entire podcast. What did you think of Jeff Goldblum in his screen debut in this movie as Freak Number One? Uh, Oh man, he is just like hamming it up. He's like you said, uh, <laughs> like reveling at the chance to be on screen. I think uh, there's this really cool thing. I, I didn't really pick up on it early enough to like track. Uh, there's this like filmic thing going on where there's like this fisheye anamorphic thing uh, that's happening whenever the freaks or are on screen, uh, which happens a lot yeah. in the beginning. And it sort of happens uh, whenever whenever Kersey's at his office or at home before he has the gun. 
uh, where it's like everything's distorted and weird. And then once he like becomes a man, everything's normal and <laughs> fine, which is strange. But uh, like the freaks are really playing with that. Like there's a lot of them getting close to the camera, especially in the uh, supermarket, like them throwing the turkey around <laughs> or whatever the fuck they're doing. <laughs> Um, that was like, but yeah. like all the mischief they're causing in the supermarket. It's just them like running around and like, and, like just tossing, just knocking food. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty great. Like, I, yeah, I really enjoy watching that. <laughs> like they see like they they're like obviously there's like a like Goldblum plays his character with some menace throughout, I guess. Um, yeah. But like it seems like their entire day just consists of them going through supermarkets and like knocking stuff off the shelves. <laughs> For that, like, one they seem minute. like Simpsons characters <laughs> exactly. or something. Uh, literally, Je- 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 Jeff Goldblum is wearing like a Jughead Jones um, hat, like from Archie. <laughs> like he's yeah. like it's the kind of hat with like the crown thing on it, like like Jughead has. It was very <laughs> that was my first yeah. thought. It's like why is he wearing a Jughead hat? But yeah, I I thought that was all really fun, and and then uh, you know it starts to get uh, unsettling when they ch- take the address off the the uh, delivery slip for the the groceries. And then they go up the stairs, and the guy's like, "I gotta, I'm gonna do an art or whatever." He's, "I'm gonna do a thing," I think he says, and he just like spray paints the wall in one line. <laughs> like, I was like, "What?" Um, so yeah, I mean, up until they bust in the door and attack uh, the the women, uh, it was pretty fun. It was pretty goofy and weird, and right. and uh, Goldblum is really hamming it up. And then even the the attack is brutal and hard to watch and uncomfortable. But even then, he's I don't want to say trying to be funny. But he's doing, like, these weird deliveries, like, calling, um, oh, but I forget Mrs. Kersey's, like, uh, first name. Is it jo- Sally uh, Joanne, Joanna. Joanna is her first name. Joanne. Okay. Joanne, uh, and he's calling her, like, mother, and he's like, get your purse, mother, and he's, like, kind of doing this, like, jive talk thing. Right, yeah. Uh, which was fun uh, up in, up until it, it becomes not fun very quickly. Right. Uh, I, think, I think he's being fun in the way that it's kind of fun to watch people be evil on screen kind of thing like the evil villain yeah. evil villain kind of performance like handled up a little bit but yeah like he's playing he's obviously playing a despicable character um but he makes his impression like he like he really like even though it's his first time on screen uh and he's kind of with two other guys and like they're basically unknowns at this point like after you watch that sequence you're like okay goldblum was like this like this guy freak number one whoever he was uh he's like the standout here right um, yeah, and I don't know if we're just thinking that now because like we know who Jeff Goldblum is and we know what we're looking for basically. Um, like I don't know if we would have had that same reaction back in 1974 um, when we watched Death Wish for the first time. Right. But you know, in retrospect, like it's very clear that like Jeff Goldblum is like the like there's a there's a standout performance there, and it's Goldblum. <laughs> but yeah, and I and you know I had forgotten how brutal the rape scene is in the movie. Um, and how effective Goldblum is as a guy taking great pleasure in terrorizing these people. Uh, and again, only has a few lines, but he makes them count. Uh, he really, um, he really um, makes that rape scene effective. And then it really, I think that adds a lot of weight to everything that Bronson's doing throughout the movie. Which, you know, again, I have not seen the Death Wish sequels. From what I understand, they get a lot cartoonier as, um, <laughs> as they go mm. on. Uh, which was kind of the case for a lot of action franchises in the 70s and 80s. You know, like the Rambo series, for example. Um, yeah. But, you know, like like you know, Rambo First Blood, like, Death Wish, like, they, they're both coming from, like, a very real emotional place, uh, and then that kind of gets lost in the sequels as they keep going. And sometimes the sequels are enjoyable, but, like, the, the original that really, like, delves into, like, the, the psychiatry and, like, the why of what's happening, um, and the emotional toll this all takes on these people, like, uh, you know, it, it's more effective, and I think Goldblum is a key part of that uh, in this movie. Uh, I mean, even, even by the third act of this movie, this movie is more cartoonish, uh, yes. <laughs> than it is in the first and second acts. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, I guess by the third act, it really becomes much more of a conventional action movie, I guess. Yeah. Um, for sure. But, uh, all right. So normally, you know, when on the old podcast, I would ask, how do you think this role fits into the roles that we've seen this actor play so far? This is the first thing that we've seen Jeff Goldblum play so far. Uh, <laughs> so how do you think this fits into your image of Jeff Goldblum? as you know him today, Mike? Uh, I mean, I kind of, I guess, answered that in the the introduction, that he would go on to sort of play freak number one for the rest of his career. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean, like, this despicable, gross, sleazy character, but just, like, right. that name. Like, he's just a freak. He's just uh, doing his own <laughs> weird thing in so many of his performances. And But, like, you can even see it. Like, he, he doesn't have the kind of uh, Goldblum stutter delivery thing uh, for freak number one. But he's always got, he's had a very distinct like pattern to his speech and uh, you know his cadence for talking and all that stuff and and uh, he's always made an impression as like you know from my uh, 
pop culture memory of him. Uh, yeah. And it's it's interesting to see that uh, start here where he's got, what was it, three minutes of screen time, you said? Something like that. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm estimating. Like I, I, ge- I genuinely thought it was like 30 seconds or whatever at first. Um, it, yeah, it feels uh, like it. Yeah, you know, but then I watched it again this time, and I was like, okay, obviously it's more than that. Like, there's the scene at the grocery store, which is like a minute long, and then there's the following. It's probably, honestly, like maybe close to five minutes of screen time. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I mean, he, he makes an impression for sure, and... Uh, I, you know, it's going to be fun to see uh, that that presence evolve uh, for the rest of this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think you're right. He does, you know, he's playing a quote unquote freak for the rest of his career, essentially. <laughs> um, but obviously, a very different, like, you know, th- this to me does not fit the image of what I think of with Jeff Goldblum. Um, because, you know, he, he has built his career on a very unconventional charm and quirkiness, uh, so much so that even, like, Disney Plus has a Jeff Goldblum series now where he just goes and learns about <laughs> things, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, fair. And that Jeff Goldblum is not the Jeff Goldblum in Death Wish, <laughs> essentially. Uh, like, to, see, <laughs> to see him playing a role like this, I think, is very unusual. And it's the kind of thing where I think if he were, like, a little bit more established at the time, like, if this was, like, if he had made his screen debut, like, in 1971 or something as opposed to 1974 and it made a couple of movies and got his name out there i think he might have turned a role like this down um is my is my is yeah. my guess uh and i and you can tell when you're watching the movie that like he's uh, i don't think he's even contemplating necessarily like he realizes he's playing a, dist- a despicable character and disturbing character um but i think he is more excited to just be in a movie <laughs> because right. because he's literally i think he was born in the early 60s i want to say he's like 17 to 19 years old uh when he's filming this movie you wow. know like just be like you're not even considering the weight of everything going on within the scene around you you're just excited to be on set in a film uh with you know a big name actor like charles bronson and a director like michael winner who's been making you know movies like this for a while well, that was a shocking scene in the true sense of the it word. was at the time wasn't yeah. it brutal it was the first movie i ever did i wonder if it was hard on the Actors, what the atmosphere on the set is when you're doing something like that. I had nothing to compare it to. It was the first movie I ever did. It was in 1973. Yeah. I was thrilled to be doing it and uh, had uh, knew that it required plenty of rage and uh, delinquent, uh, mm-hmm. uh, delinquent uh, stuff, and uh, just uh, in, enjoyed it and enjoyed it. And I, you know, I tried to, I think, tried to make the crew feel like, hey, where'd they get this? Is this one a real guy? Is this a... Because I was not a, you know, street fellow. I was born, my dad was a doctor in Pittsburgh and stuff. So, But I kind of relished this chance to... Is he, is he the real guy? So I uh-huh. didn't bathe and things, you know. And, and that, that... I think they thought I was the real guy. Hmm? These guys seemed real, and you particularly mm-hmm. gave me the creeps. And, uh, Thank you. I don't know if I'd ever you. see you again. Uh, dark alley. At this point, you know... From this point forward, Jeff Goldblum works pretty steadily. There's no, there's no like break in the Goldblum career at this point. I mean, he's in um, a couple of Robert Altman movies next, and then there's a couple of other like he reunites with Michael Winner at one point. He gets to work with Woody Allen. Like, there's a lot of like, you know, kind of big name directors that very quickly jump on the Goldblum train, I guess. And in, and usually in smaller parts in the, like, the early '70s and stuff. As the, as but yeah. as, as things progress, you know, uh, Goldblum becomes Goldblum, and uh, we'll see uh, that kind of coalesce later in the podcast as uh, more episodes get released over over the course of the next four years uh, <laughs> prob- <laughs> <Yeah>. probably <laughs> most likely yeah most likely uh so as far as any moments or scenes that stand out to you in death wish mike i mean um i i, I had it written down to cover the goldblum stuff first but i feel like you know we've already kind of covered everything that <laughs> involves jeff goldblum in this movie yeah um you know they're at the, they're at the grocery store tossing things around maria from sesame street is there uh, and she kind of just gives them a look like, come on, guys. Uh, uh, you did mention when they go up the stairwell and one guy's like, I'm going to do a thing and just spray paints like a line on the wall. Uh, and, yeah. and that's when Goldblum responds to him with his very first line of dialogue uh, on screen, um, which is, shit, man, got business. <laughs> and they keep, keep walking up. Hey, I'm going to do a thing. Shit, man, got business. Let's go, man. So they pretend to be, to be delivering groceries to get let into the apartment, then start attacking. They beat the wife up. Um, they rip off the daughter's pants, start tagging her with spray paint, and then Goldblum proceeds to assault her. Uh, and then they run off. That's the last you see of them. This is actually this is actually the only Death Wish movie in which Bronson does not get revenge on people who killed his loved ones. Um, wow, interesting. Yeah, which I do believe to be intentional. Uh, like the idea, like no matter how many other 
bad people he kills. He has no way of knowing who did this to his family and nothing he does is going to bring back his wife or take that experience back from his daughter anyway. Um, so I, I, I do think it is intentional. And like I mentioned, there was like an earlier version of the script where he did face off against these guys towards the end of the movie and he died by their hand or whatever. Um, right. So I, I think, you know, which makes, which is what I feel like makes me believe Death Wish has much more on its mind than just being a standard rape revenge uh, thriller, as, yeah. as opposed to maybe the Death Wish sequels or any of the other like rape revenge movies that are being released around the same time. Yeah, you can kind of tell there's something there. Uh, like we said, there's kind of that section where his life starts to get unhinged and, and he's being, you know, uh, trailed by the police and they're harassing him and all this stuff. And, and then uh, it kind of just uh, f- goes away for the last 15 minutes where it's just like, no, nope, action hero guy. Right. Uh, which, like, eh, well, eh, it happens. It does give us, like, one of the best final shots of a movie ever of all time. It's so Charles cool. Bronson doing the fin- finger gun at the camera. It's so oh, fuck, cool. dude. <laughs> Uh, you know it's so upsettingly cool basically (laughs) yeah i'm mad how good it is i know um yeah that's a great final shot uh and i I did allude to this before but i also did appreciate that the movie had the uh the rape the sexual assault actually take a serious psychological toll on the daughter uh like there are uh, you know a lot of of ones a lot of movies where the assault happens and then we're pretty much solely focused on the male character getting revenge uh this one you know there's a couple of scenes with her and like there's one where she's like repulsed by her husband's touch like the son-in-law yeah who like it's like hey you want to and she like screams and goes across the other end of the bed uh and eventually is so traumatized um she has to go to an asylum and at which point she's pretty much written out of the movie uh which which is unfortunate um but yeah. there, but there is like you know lip service paid to the fact that this event you know has affected her in some way um as opposed to you know going back to the previous season of this podcast something like seeking justice where right where which was a Nicolas cage movie where his wife is played by january jones um and she gets raped in the movie and then it is pretty much all about Nicolas cage and like never does that movie ever confront the idea that january jones might also have been affected by that in some way um, <laughs> yeah uh yeah i mean it's it's not like great in this movie because it's all it's still all about like how her husband can't live with it uh and like all and like how her father must get revenge but like she is there, like the character is there. Uh, yes. <laughs> like she, like you said, they acknowledge her. They go visit her in the hospital. Uh, most movies, they just dis- the, the assaulted woman just disappears. Uh, right. And, you know. So that that is an aspect of the movie that I do um, appreciate. Like it's at least trying to do something with that, essentially. Yeah. Um, otherwise, any what what are the other scenes that stood out to you in this movie, Mike? Uh, my my one, I have a note uh, when when uh, Kersey goes to uh, Tucson. Yeah. And he has uh, that whole, like, ah, real America montage. Um, <laughs> like, that whole section of the movie. Um, which is hilarious, because it happens on a movie set when he visit, he sees this, like, Old West reenactment, uh, right. which is, like, so weird. I mean, that the whole section is really cool, where it's, like, uh, you know, like, the thing, you'd, the stunt show you'd see at Universal or something. Uh, so that, sec- that whole section. And then, but the one that I really wanted to highlight, because uh, it was just so, like, peaceful, uh, was just the, like couple minute montage of Kersey and his crew like surveying the land they're supposed to develop and it goes on for like a, like it's like two minutes of him just like ah oh, looking through the thing and then writing notes right. and then a guy driving and then like you know we got like kind of funky Herbie Hancock music over it and like yeah. I would I would watch 90 minutes of that <laughs> it's just him <laughs> surveying that'd be great yeah I mean that was kind of the thing with exploitation movies especially in the 70s was like you know a lot a lot of them have like a really, really long build-up <laughs> to get to, like, the actual yeah. exploitation stuff that happens in, like, the last third of the movie or whatever. Uh, and death, and so a lot of that means... Sometimes that means a lot of, like, just filling for time until, like, the stuff can happen. Um, and that, like, <laughs> accidentally made, like, a lot of, like, really fun movies <laughs> as a result. Yeah. Uh, you know, where it's just, like, kind of filling time and doing stuff. And, like, yeah, he's just watching Paul do his thing, working as an architect and... <laughs> all that yeah it's pretty solid i would watch a movie about charles bronson being an architect is what I, is what i'm saying yeah <laughs> i think that would be great but yeah i do i do like that and i also really enjoy the touristy western show that um that paul ends up watching mm-hmm. in tucson um which does reflect the movie also it doesn't feel purposeless it feels like you know because the show is about like an ordinary citizen like standing up against people terrorizing their town and that kind of thing and yeah. so it's not subtle by any means but it's just you see it <laughs> you see it and like you see it in paul's face and it's like hmm interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the like uh the western motif like you know the final well, not, well no it's not the final line of the movie but uh after kersey has the standoff at the end and the yeah. the detective or the sergeant is like i just need you to get out of town and he looks at him and goes inspector 
by sundown. Right. And it's like, okay, we, we get it. <laughs> kind of uh, brings to himself. Yeah, I did like that. Apparently, yeah. there, was, there was an early draft of the script where, like, um, Bronson kept say, like was supposed to keep saying like a lot of different western things and most of them were cut from the movie um, but like yeah, he was going to have a lot of like western style one liners or something after <laughs> after he killed people and all that stuff um, I, I did want to shout out I mean we kind of mentioned these before but the opening scenes with Bronson and his wife on vacation in Hawaii um, they were not in the script originally uh, from what I understand really uh, yeah they were actually Michael Winner the director of the film uh, added them in um, and he made the I think correct choice um, that we need to see Joanna living her life at least a little bit um, <laughs> before the horror before she gets killed by Jeff Goldblum and his gang um, yeah you know because otherwise if you don't have that sequence then she's literally just you see her at the grocery store and then she dies basically <laughs> basically Holy um, so you <laughs> yeah, have that's so a good you, point so you have that sequence and you kind of establish like how much they like she and charles bronson love each other and then it also sets up the photographs that paul sees later in the movie that first inspire him to become a vigilante too so there is uh, that aspect as well so uh, i did want to show that out because i think it's actually a really cool kind of behind the scenes story of michael winters being like no we need to have something here <laughs> <laughs> To, we need some sort of story to make to make her a semblance of a character. We need to have something here. <laughs> yeah, I also uh, one more detail about the Tucson uh, segment. I really liked how, like you know, uh, Kersey, he's in the suit, and the guy, the guy when he sees him at the airport is like, ah, you must, you you look like a New Yorker. You must be the guy, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. And then uh, there's the whole thing where the whole you know sequence where he goes to the gun club and the guy right. shows him how to shoot or gives him the gun and, and Kersey like. My father was a hunter. Pow, pow, pow. And you like, you know, can hit the bullseye. Uh, all this stuff. And we got that whole backstory. Uh, and I love, like, immediately the very next scene, he's wearing, like, a, like a unbuttoned denim shirt. <laughs> like, he goes from wearing suits and ties to immediately, like, denim shirt with the top two buttons open. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> yeah it's pretty great it's subtle yeah I, I really love that scene at the gun club too because yeah he has that whole monologue about his dad was a hunter and he died in a hunting accident he hasn't touched a gun since gets a bullseye right away uh and then <laughs> yeah. and jane and jane Schill, the guy in the cowboy hat from the rockford files is like um he says like uh you new yorkers you probably think that all guns are an extension of our penises or something like that <laughs> and bronson's like yeah something like that and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was pretty good, Bronson. Thank you. I've been practicing for years. Uh, they, they, they used to be, like, for some reason, on the this happened a lot on The Simpsons where they would do, like, just random Charles Bronson jokes um, back in the day. Um, sure. But there's, like, one, one of my favorite jokes ever on The Simpsons um, is, with, I, I, I think it's the later season, too. Um, but my brother and I would quote it all the time. They're trying to get to Branson, Missouri. And then they, they show up and it's like, wait, this isn't Branson. And they turn around and everybody is has Charles Bronson's face. It's like, no, pal, you're in Bronson, Missouri. <laughs> and there's wow. like a mom and a kid. And the, the kid's like, hey, ma, how about some cookies? <laughs> and the mom's like, no rice. <laughs> this is over. <laughs> It's wow. the best. There's also a great Death Wish joke on The Simpsons, too, where um, I'm just going to re recap Simpsons from the rest of this podcast. Yeah, this is the Simpsons portion of the episode. This, yes, this happens a lot on the podcast. Uh, there's, a, there's a great <laughs> Death Wish joke on The Simpsons where there's a, a commercial for a Death Wish movie, and it's Death Wish 9, and it's just Charles Bronson sitting in a hospital bed, and he's going, Ugh, I wish I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I don't yeah. know what I was expecting. But... Well, there it is. <laughs> um, wow. But, yeah, so he's he, – that, that whole scene at the gun club, getting back to that, really good. I really yeah. I really like Jane Schill, actually, he, the guy in the cowboy hat. I thought he was a lot of fun yeah. to just have around. And then he's the one who gives Charles Bronson his gun um, right. at, the, at the halfway point of the movie. And then things start to escalate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so going from there, then the actual like movie actually kind of begins, I guess. Uh, and Bronson's first kill, where he turns around, already has the gun in his hand, uh, under his coat. Just, it's just fucking, it's mm -hmm. just so, so fucking cool. It's so neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the uh, the the vigilante m murders <laughs> are pretty cool. Uh, yeah. The the you know the one that Joker ripped off uh, on the train <laughs> is pretty great. Yeah, I was a, uh, I didn't realize that was a Death Wish riff when I saw Joker um, in in October. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so when I was watching the subway scene in this movie, I was like, hey, 
This seems really familiar. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Uh, are they going to start singing Send to the Clowns at some point here? Like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a subway scene where he shoots two muggers, uh, and that really did make me think of Joker. Um, but also, I think that that one also establishes that, like, I think when the first kill happens, like, he's walking around in the park in the dark, and, like, you can kind of assume maybe he's just doing that. Like, he's prepared for something to happen, but it's not like he's looking right. for something to happen. Uh, and by the time you get to the subway scene, it's like, okay, he's like actively trying to draw markers to him so he can do, so he can do this. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, what you get with the subway scene. The guy, and he shoots the guy through the newspaper and then runs out and shoots the guy in the, in the thing. Um, and then I kind of like, I, you know, I really enjoyed the way, um, the, the Bronson starts inspiring other New Yorkers to fight back also. Mm hmm. Which also weirdly Joker esque um, in in the movie in, in Joker. Oh my god! <laughs> it's weird. I mean, we, there was so much talk about Joker riffing on um, Taxi Driver and the Can Comedy. Uh, I guess it just completely like like and maybe because I hadn't seen Death Wish in like eight years, it just like completely went past me that like it's also really riffing on Death Wish. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah, me too. Honestly, even though I saw it a year before <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Death Wish. Um, but yeah, that whole sequence where he's like Bronson's watching the news, and you see the woman on the news who like attacks somebody with a hat pin, and, and she's yeah, uh, which is great. And then you have the construction workers ganging up on one guy or whatever, like they're all just chasing him <laughs> down, the thing. and they're like, and the newspaper's like, oh, I, I heard he had like a you know two broken legs and a broken collarbone or whatever, and it's like, oh, I guess he must have fell, and like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mugs at the camera yeah. <laughs> that was really good though yeah it was pretty funny uh and i wait, i also loved uh, oh go ahead I was say, which makes me feel like you know like there are elements of this movie that are aiming at satire in some way um but then there's yeah. also parts of it that are like this is like clearly endorsing what paul Garcia is doing it's like it's a movie that like, feels like it's at odds with itself in certain ways yeah, I also really love uh, uh, the police sergeant or detective guy who uh, you recognized, but I forget what his name was already. Off the uh, head. Vincent Gardenia from Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, he's just he's he's a delight in this movie, and I love the running bit that he's like always sick, and he's always like using an inhaler or like right. nose spray or like putting like stuff in his mouth or sneezing like the whole movie and i don't right. really get it but it's amazing <laughs> yeah i mean it, the second half of the movie becomes like a cat and mouse game between him and kersey um yeah and so it's like him and he's like kind of trying to hunt him down and he re eventually figures out that um bronson is the vigilante um but then the police decide like they can't just arrest him because then he becomes a martyr for the city and also like crime is down so much that they don't really want to like put it out there that the guy who's killing muggers is gone right so right. they just say to vincent gardini that you need to take care of him <laughs> which could mean a lot of things. i think the idea is they want him to they want him to kill <laughs> paul kersey i think so uh, that seemed like the original implication but instead what happens is you know at the end of the movie charles bronson gets in another big gunfight i think this was like three guys in the park or something like that um yeah and then uh, Kersey gets shot, and he's there's kind of like this big chase sequence and stuff like that. And then eventually Kersey takes out the other muggers, but then Kersey's like in such bad condition he has to be taken to the hospital. Uh, and that's when the, the uh, Vincent Cardini kind of follows him, and that's when Christopher Guest shows up, uh, yes, <laughs> making a guest appearance um, in hey. in this movie. Uh, and Christopher Guest is the guy is the young cop who like finds Charles Bronson's gun and is like, I think it's the gun that belongs to the killer. Uh, or, to the, or to the vigilante or whatever. Um, and he gives it to Vincent Gardenia, and Vincent Gardenia kind of takes it and brings it over to um, Charles Bronson. And that's when Vincent Gardenia kind of gives him, like, the ultimatum, like, you got to get out of town, basically. And right. that's when Bronson has the great line, like, by sundown, chief. Or, <laughs> or, <laughs> and so he moved to Chicago, and then you get that awesome final shot of Bronson uh, doing the finger gun at the hippies, uh, who, are yeah. who were, like, terrorizing a lady in the terminal. And, yeah, and that's Death Wish. I mean, I feel like we just ran through the entire movie. Um any other, like, kind of random sequences, scenes that you wanted to throw out there, Mike? Um, not particularly. I mean, just I, I was sort of getting at, too, every every scene with uh, Vincent Gardenia, uh, when he's, like, kind of giving the briefings in the police department, and he's like, uh, you know, we're going to go through all the records and every service, everybody's service record, and, like, how he's, like, s sort of just, like, by chance piecing together who Kersey is, because right. uh, he wants to... Well, I forget the line he says, but he, uh, he's like, when the media asks, we're going to tell them we have... Uh, hot clues but we're not going to tell him we have a thousand hot clues or something <laughs> i forget what exactly what it is uh yes. but he's like we're just gonna make up stuff until we stick uh and, and it works <laughs> it does i mean that's, i imagine that's how police work actually work <laughs> actually happens yeah uh also kind of a quick note uh not related to jeff goldblum anyway but vincent gardinia and olympia dukakis who are both in this movie were also in moonstruck with nicholas cage um 
Look at that. So there you go. You thought we were done talking about Nicolas Cage, but since this is season two, and we have an entire history of Nicolas Cage to fall back on as far as part of our references go, it's still going to come up every once in a while. Um, <laughs> yep. Does that mean, did we violate our, oh no, never mind. We didn't violate our rule. What was our rule? Because <laughs> Goldblum was never, that they couldn't have been in a movie with uh, Cage, oh, yeah. but Goldblum wasn't. <laughs> Right, yeah. Go. In the first yeah. episode, we break our <laughs> own rule. We would never be able to do another podcast if we said nobody who has ever been in a movie with people who were also in a movie with Nicolas Cage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it would never. It, we would never get this done. But uh, anyway. No. All right. So that is Death Wish, 1974, uh, and I think that about wraps up our general thoughts on the movie. Uh, you ready to move on to some letterbox reviews, Mike? Yes. What do the people have to say? Let's see what the people have to say on Letterbox. Uh, here's a one and a half star review of Death Wish which reads, I know I should be more upset at the film's abhorrent politics, but honestly, the thing that bothered me the most is that Charles Bronson's son-in-law kept calling him dad. <laughs> that is very prevalent. It's, I forgot all about so that. It's so weird. <laughs> I think it's it's just to make him look like a little bitch baby. Like, I guess so. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that might be part it's of it, so too. so weird. Because he's also supposed to be like kind of a liberal guy on the side of like Charles Bronson, too. Uh, or at least yeah. the beginning of the movie. And so, yes, yeah, at one point, Charles Bronson says, what do people do when they don't uh, stand up for themselves? And, uh, you know, uh, I think the son-in-law says, like, be civilized or something? like, <laughs> yeah. Or something like that. Um, but it is we- it is so weird how, how often he calls him dad. Like, I've thought about that. Like, I-, I have an uncle who calls my grandpa dad, who are not, he's not, like, love-related. Like, he married into the family. Uh, and every mm-hmm. time, I think it's weird. Like, I think it's so weird that he just- <laughs> I get, I get that. It's a, I get that it's a thing people do sometimes, but like, I feel like if yeah. I if I were to get married, I could not do that. <laughs> it just feels. Weird. I think. Uh, I think it's it has ended by our generation. Yeah. yeah. But that like my parents and that like that generation, they all do that. Do or they really? did that? Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it was very strange. Very okay. weird. Yeah. It's it's odd. It's odd. Here's a four star review of Death Wish, which re- which reads. Playing a dude who doesn't go around killing people on a regular basis is the most impressive acting of Charles Bronson's career. <laughs> Uh, this is a great atmospheric portrait of a grimy 70s New York with a funky score by Herbie Hancock and an intense early role for Jeff Goldblum Uh, say Jeff Goldblum mentioned figures throw it in there there it is (laughs) Uh, here's another four star review of Death Wish really solid revenge film I've never agreed with the politics here but I don't really take them seriously either Uh, this is like a fantasy version of New York straight out of a Punisher comic (laughs) Wow. Which I think is fairly accurate to say, actually. Like, it feels like a similar yeah. character, similar vibe. Uh, here's a three and a half star review of Death Wish, which reads Charles Bronson is a gun toting New Yorker running around Manhattan, killing muggers and rapists, but still keeps being called a liberal, uh, a bleeding heart liberal at one point. Its message is ridiculous, its attempts at being balanced, shallow, but you get Bronson killing bad guys. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Which I feel like is basically what we were saying this entire last hour. <laughs> uh, yep, 100%. All right, here, here's, uh, I believe, the last one, a four-star review of Death Wish, which reads, short review, wow, I forgot quite a lot about this film. I forgot how old-fashioned the filming and music feels. It's pure 70s. I forgot how great the photography is. I forgot how brutal the rape-slash-beating scene is. I forgot how much of a nut Jeff Goldblum was. Uh, I forgot how nuanced the film is regarding class struggles, and there might be a slight underlying theme criticizing urbanization. Uh, the film brilliantly starts at a lovely beach, then quickly moves to the city to create immediate contrast with all its machines and crime and troubles. The character even happens to be an urban developer of some kind, uh, so that's my deep movie thought of the day. <laughs> uh, I forgot how cool Bronson is. Overall, I forgot how great this film is. Watch it. Uh, and yeah, yeah, there you go. It's uh, Death Wish, 1974, the original, uh, and I do not believe Jeff Goldblum appears in any other Death Wish movie, so unfortunately, we will not get to review Death Wish 4, The Crackdown, or anything, <laughs> or anything else. <laughs> or, we'll never know. Or Death Wish 5, The Face of Death, which is the real title of that movie. Uh, what? <laughs> it's like, we might have to do it's, it. It's like, just, just a bonus episode for Death Wish 5. <laughs> done yeah, i'm in just because of that title it's like cube 2 hypercube but with that book. hell yes <laughs> uh all right so that wraps things up for our very first episode of season two of the complete works discussing the career of jeff goldblum so mike where can we find you online this week 
You can find me at MD Film Blog on Twitter and Letterboxd. And you can find me at uh, M Smith Film Blog on Twitter, uh, Mike Smith Film on Letterboxd, Radio Mike Sandwich on Instagram. And you can follow this podcast right now on Twitter over at, at Goldblum Pod. That is the place to go for that and for any other updates and stuff like that. Uh, thank you for listening to The Complete Works. I'm Mike Smith. That's Mike Decretio. Don't forget to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast app. And if you want to contact us, hit us up at Jeff Goldblum Complete Works at gmail.com or DM us at Goldblum Pod. Uh, and you can find the rest of our podcast on Rapture Press alongside the Review Zoo which is a podcast about comic books and movie news and all that nerdy stuff. Uh, our theme song was created by Kyle Cullen and our logo was designed by Jacob Honeycutt or at Jacob Honey on Twitter and on the next episode of the Complete Works Jeff Goldblum has a small role in Robert Altman's California Split also from 1974 with uh, George Segal and Elliot Gould and uh, you know Robert Altman is a director that um, I've watched a, a few of like his major movies not somebody that I've really connected with, but I'm, the, the description of this movie sounds really exciting to me, uh, and I'm pretty interested to check it out, at least. This will be, this will be another small gold bloom role. It's a lot of small roles leading up to the bigger stuff uh, for the yeah. first few episodes. Uh, are you familiar with California Split at all, Mike? Not even a little bit. I am uh, vaguely familiar of Altman like through cultural osmosis, Yeah, and I'm sure I've seen some of his stuff, but off the top of my hand, I couldn't tell you one of his movies. You couldn't tell me any of his movies? <laughs> really? Not off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. I mean, you recommended uh, Gosford Park in um, one of our episodes. Uh, couple... See? Yeah, there you go. Told you. All right, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll be doing California Split in the next episode. Looking forward to that. Plus, keep an eye out for the next Mike and Mike Go to the Movies, where we'll be talking the Oscars, which will have aired uh, by this Sunday, and Birds of Prey, or the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, uh, which I'm also very much looking forward to. I heard good things uh, about that yeah. one. Uh, all right, and that's going to be it for uh, this episode. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and remember to go for the gold blue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy that you forgot what that was and surprised yourself while you were reading it. Yeah, that was pretty great. <laughs> <laughs>